we are moving on to lecture where we are going to talk about specific polymers and their recycling so uh, polyethylene uh, when we talk about you know it's an addition polymers and in polyethylene we have various types of polyethylene we have ldp lldp hdp polyethylene is the most used polymer along with pp across the globe largely used in packaging applications of various items like food pharmaceutical fmcg and so many applications packaging uh, it's very popular and uh, because they are chemically and biologically inert environmental or microbial degradation is simply negligible now what are the packaging based applications we are talking about post consumer packaging based applications we look at post consumer polyethylene films recycling uh, and uh, basically this is driven by consumer and legislative pressures this post consumer film recycling has gained momentum and is now one of the largest growing segments of the recycling industry uh this films consist of ld lld and hdp which is accounted mostly for applications like grocery sacks stretch and shrink wrap films agricultural mulch films packaging films blow molding drums and they might have uh, thicknesses ranging from 0.2 to 5 mm the primary challenge to recycling the film is contamination according to an industry estimate around 25% of all grocery bags are contaminated and require very thorough washing in the recycling process which doesn't make the recycling process as really profitable we are talking about primary and secondary over here so this is the same uh, where we are taking a bale film uh, it is put into a breaker shredder the bales are broken down it is passed through a vibratory conveyor uh, where the material is going to be separated out based on the density not exactly on the density basis on the uh, bale and then from there it is going to pass through into the sedimentation tank where uh, density principle is going to be used there is going to be size reduction in a granulator it is going to go into the washer for cleaning it is going to then pass into a wet separator something like a trommel or a rotary screen then going to go into a dryer where you can use thermal or air drying methods and then it is going to get into a pelletizer or an extruder where it is going to get pelletized and then process for packaging in particular the next uh, is uh, we have talked about films we are now going to look at woven sacks so woven sacks are made from fabric that has been woven to give the fabric strength so these are individual strands of plastics which are then knitted together or maybe woven together just as we have fibers in our shirt the process of weaving involves joining individual threads together to make a single piece of material that is what you can see in front of you doing this over and over again creates one large piece of cloth and you will have power looms that are uh, they are manufactured by a lot of companies across our country and the globe and they have a very big automated line where you can go for uh, small uh, 25 kg or even 5 kg bags to larger sizes of ibcs that is intermediate bulk containers which can take up to 1 ton of material in one bag the cloth is then used to manufacture tote bags under a number of different styles and shapes so weaving styles can be different so advantages include woven cloth is flexible it is able to retain its shape well woven fabrics are strong therefore bags can be reused multiple times the woven bag can be cleaned in a washing machine as well it can be designed in a laminated or a matte finish a lawn laminated woven bag is not recommended as they will have a cheap look these are woven products so this is uh, raffia washing uh, process flow sheet the material is fed now these are very similar approaches uh, depending on what kind of waste you have so, okay next is uh, polyethylene terephthalate so uh, this is how pet is basically synthesized so uh, pet is a polyester right so it's a polycrystalline polyester formed by the esterification of uh, terephthalic acid and ethylene glycol so it's a diabasic acid and it's a diol or it can be manufactured from the transesterification of dimethyl terephthalate with ethylene glycol synthesis of pet either happens through the two reaction steps that are shown here the first is the formation of an intermediate monomer which is uh, named as bhet that is bis hydroxy ethyl terephthalate with the release of small molecules because this is a condensation polymerization you will always see small molecules getting liberated uh, out of the process which is either water or methanol the second is the polycondensation of bis hydroxy ethyl terephthalate which is also known as transesterification to produce pet in the melt phase with the release of ethylene glycol under high vacuum right so this is the two reactions that are shown here is first is from pure terephthalic acid adding ethylene glycol into terephthalic acid reaching up to bhet 
the second one is uh, transesterification of dimethyl terephthalate can be done with ethylene glycol and it again makes this bhat so the first one is glycolysis of pet so glycolytic re recycling of pet can be done in a continuous or in a batch process is preferentially performed by addition of pet waste to boiling ethylene glycol which leads to the formation of low molecular weight intermediates and eventually to crystallize diglycol terephthalate the rate of degradation reaction primarily is controlled of course any reaction is controlled by various parameters over here we are talking about how much time you are going to hold uh, pet flakes in that glycol mixture what is the temperature at which you are processing it and of course it will depend on uh, what you are basically adding as a catalyst as well so there can be titanium der derivatives that can be used and pet is to glycol ratio can also be adjusted to understand the yield or change the yield it is also necessary to avoid side reactions which may occur by adding buffers which will control or stabilize the process or by keeping down the reaction time and temperature biodegradation can be uh, carried out by ester hydrolyzing enzyme so pet can be hydrolyzed but then uh, it it happens in extreme conditions and esterase is the enzyme which can bring about uh, the disintegration of pet so esterase and some other microorganisms are known to biodegrade polyesters at a reaction rate depending upon the structure of the polyester while many aliphatic polyesters uh, so we find uh, there are uh, aliphatic polyesters that are there which are totally biodegradable in nature specifically polyhydroxy fatty acids so biopol is one of the materials that is marketed across the globe and it's marketed by uh, commercialized by ICI and uh, are suitable for biodegradation and the aromatic polyesters pet do not possess this kind of a property so it will be very difficult to sort of degrade aromatic polyesters but aliphatic because of the long chain branching it then can be broken down slightly more easily than the aromatic ones so another approach will consist of mixing small amounts of biodegradable polymers uh, that is polysaccharide with regular polymer in order to make the end product destroyable as well but the thing to note here is that the amount of biodegradable material that you have added in the polymer only that part will disintegrate and it will make you feel like the whole uh, material is disintegrating but that is not the case however the thermal stability of starch derivatives about 230 is limited whereas when we are talking about pet processing it happens uh, in above excess of 265 to 270 degrees centigrade so that remains a problem that starch if you are adding it will disintegrate uh, at these processing temperatures next is pvc that is polyvinyl chloride so uh, vinyl chloride monomer is produced from the chlorination of ethylene and the pyrolysis of resulting ethylene dichloride as in the cracking unit pvc has a glass transition temperature of around 70 to 80 degrees centigrade and is formed by the polymerization of vinyl chloride monomer via the bulk or the suspension method so the pertinent thing to note here is that pvc compounds are generally or pvc materials generally available in the powdered form and pvc is an economical and a versatile thermoplastic polymer widely used in building and construction industry to produce door and window profiles pipes uh, portable water drinking it is very applicable then wire and cable insulation medical devices as well a large market of pvc is there in medical devices again it is the world's third largest thermoplastic material by volume after polyethylene and polypropylene it is white and brittle solid material available in powdered form due to its versatile properties such as lightweight durable low cost and easy processability pvc is now replacing traditional bulk materials like wood and it has in fact done it metal concrete rubber ceramics etc in several materials this is again uh, where pvc generally goes so it find major part is going into profiles then we have pipes and fittings then uh, miscellaneous rigid bottles so we find uh, this medical application is playing its part here then there is rigid film which is around 9% coated fabrics 3% flooring that is carpeting is around 6% cable application 7% flexible tubes and profile around 3% right so this is where it is basically spread what are the benefits so pvc is well suited for recycling it has in fact the longest history of recycling of all plastics so large volumes of recyclable pvc waste are available using recycled pvc help meeting the source resource efficiency objectives and allows for the preservation of raw materials and using recycled pvc reduces emission and landfill requirements and in addition due to its thermoplastic nature pvc can be recycled several times without significant loss of its performance so frp refers to 
the class of composite building materials for existing of fibrous reinforcement encased in a polymer matrix the polymer matrix is applied as a liquid resin and chemically cured to a solid the reinforcing materials are typically glass fibers but they can also be different uh, kevlar aramid carbon boron so they can be a lot of other materials as well the fiber content of these composite materials can range from less than 5% to greater than around 60% by weight. Now, what are the manufacturing techniques? Uh, there can be hand layup, spray up, closed mold infusion, compression molding. These are some of the techniques that are used. Uh, now, what are the recycling techniques? And we'll touch upon each of them one by one. And we'll try and conclude what is basically uh, the best one out of it. So, you can go for mechanical recycling. Incineration is something which is practiced on a mass scale at this point in time. So you can incinerate it. You can go for thermal and chemical recycling as well. But then again, a lot of chemicals are involved there, temperature and then energy efficiency comes into the question. So mechanical recycling, what you can simply do is take a thermosetting material, an FRB or whatever it is, grind it and grind it to finer particle size and use that finer powder into other other material as a filler, possibly into a thermosetting resin only. So the pros or the advantages include it is cost effective and technically feasibility has been proven. But uh, the problem remains is that although FRP is a very strong component, but the powder that you are going to get out of it is a low value end product. The material properties are poor, inconsistent and the cost competitiveness is poor as well. The equipment reliability is not yet proven. We are talking about the grinder because we need to have consistent particle sizes and there are safety concerns as well. The second is in incineration, that is energy recovery. It's an established process used in Japan where landfill costs are really high. It can be used in cement factories. So incineration uh, very popularly, even for multi-layered films, cement factories are very popular. The cons include environmental concerns because we are talking about burning. There can be uh, cases of air pollution, it's a hazardous waste. A lot of times you will find uh, these aromatics and even uh, bisphenol based compounds are used in uh, polyesters, uh, modified polyesters like vinyl esters and all. They can prove to be uh, hazardous and the fiber content still ends up in the landfill. Next is thermal recycling. So you can uh, look at pyrolysis, which is heating of scrap to recover polymer material as an oil. And this is very popular for thermosetting materials, which are rubbers. So rubber tires and all uh, have been uh, successfully worked upon a pyrolysis plant. So air pollution effects are lower than incineration. Fiber is also recoverable, although still it has some surface defect because even pyrolysis are, is done at higher temperatures, although it is done in an absence of oxygen. Recovered oil can be used as a fuel or a resin feedstock and it has proven success with carbon fiber. Cons include high capital cost and uh, it's still early in the process life cycle. The last one is chemical recycling. So you find that in chemical recycling, you're actually going to put it in a monomer or a solvent where the, the, the cross-linked thermoset is going to dissolve. But then you would find that it is not going to dissolve that easily. You might need to have elevated temperatures or maybe conditions which are really aggressive to that thermosetting material and that is where along with the solvent you are also incorporating energy and then it becomes slightly more difficult when we are talking from a commercial perspective. So the pros include that fibers retain most of their original strength and the cons include typically requires granulating the scrap so smaller pieces you have to convert it into smaller pieces to have lesser uh, volume of solvent use. And then uh, when we are breaking it down, there is going to be fiber damage and it uses large amount of potentially hazardous solvents and it's capital intensive and it's an emerging technology.